The Book of Recollections, Episode 28, Dust and Desperation, by Dysylvania. Oh, reader, dear reader, gather close, for we are on the brink of oblivion this time. Desperate measures, desert sands, and a herald of deadly horror. What more could we ask? Take a deep breath. You'll need it. It's going down. In Ramidava, that blistering sun-scorched capital, our companions bartered with locals for precious water, the only lifeline in these infernal sands. Meanwhile, Tulrok and Adam, now into an ascended bodiless spirit, inspected the site of the ritual that had pulled him from his mortal life. The two retrieved the scattered relics Adam could no longer touch. And, in the process, they made a chilling discovery. Signs of a second ritual, one Adam had not performed, but the Leftos might have, and perhaps to deadly effect. Had the Genasi sought her own ascension? Or worse, had she aimed to trap Adam in this spectral form that was holy to her? Reunited with their companions, Isari, Amma, Amma, Shak, Pax, and Tulrok, the party prepared to brave the wilderness with the unethically sourced water supply. Together, with all the donations gathered from the locals, they pursued the route heading toward their destinations, the fabled Dava of Sarmisejatuza, hoping to discover evidence of the dark force threatening both the Red and Green Kingdoms. But in those lands, water was worth more than gold, and their demands for more supplies tested even Asari's celestial patience. In her struggle to fulfill their needs, she strained against her own moral teachings, and her divine light dimmed in anguish. Oh, sweet Isari, the weight of devotion bears heavy in a land even more thirsty for salvation than for water, doesn't it? Into the shifting sands, following the path well known by Ama and Ama, hazards mounted. Fires erupted out of thin air, scorching their path. Blistering heat seemed to tighten its grasp on them, driving them to desperation. Then, like a plague summoned by cursed words, a dense swarm of locusts clouded the sky, devouring not just the flesh of the travelers, but even wood, stone, anything in their way. Supplies dwindled to ash, their numbers thinned, and the sand was merciless. Every footstep only buried them deeper in trouble. With most of the supplies soon reduced to cinders and their bodies blistering under the relentless sun, the group managed to take shelter down a ravine, finding reprieve in the meager shade. Far ahead, they glimpsed their goal, the citadel, a lone shape against the distant horizon, but it might as well have been on another world. Wounded, Dazed, but resolute, they pushed through the ravine, their scant supplies barely enough to sustain them. Along the way, they stumbled upon the remains of other travelers, lost to the desert's wrath. From their belongings, the party recovered an artifact of legend, a jinn's lamp, dusty and ancient. No one dared to rub it. Not yet. Tulrok was entrusted to be its keeper. The price of a wish, they knew, was never clear, until too late. Onward, inching closer to the Dava, the desert seemed to shift, ominous. A figure appeared on the horizon, more nightmare than a man. A ghastly, skeletal figure with massive, tattered wings that seemed to be made of shadow and broken bone. Its face was obscured by a crimson mask made of a second red skin, blending grotesquely with its skeletal visage. It had no mouth but a hole and it wielded a great sword that radiated a dark, pulsing energy. That was no ordinary foe, but as the stars revealed, the Crimson Apostle himself, the Herald, came to darken their path with death. Rita, if ever our heroes had a chance to flee, it had passed. This being could smell fear like blood, and he was hungry for both. Without parley, the herald struck with grace and deathly precision, his shadowed blade slicing through the air toward Isari. His mere presence dimmed her divine aura, 
threatening to snuff out her celestial light entirely, and the shadow blade swallowed more of her light. In that burning desert, a fevered melee ensued, yet the hero's magic, bound by the unforgiving land, proved feeble against his unholy strength. They were helpless, their powers silenced, outmatched by the Crimson Herald's forbidden magic, uncensored, that twisted life into despair. With each clash of steel, dread mounted, blinded and beaten, Isari's spirit flickered as Adam's spectral form began to fade too. None of their might, neither steel nor spell, could stop this herald who spoke only in hissing whispers of Fem. In their last desperate gasp, they took to the Jinn's lamp, invoking its legendary powers for aid. Dear Tulrock made the first wish, but his words were twisted. The Jinn Efreet answered with mockery, as was his obligation. His wish rendered effectively useless. The Goliath made a second wish, as death approached his companions even closer, pleading for the Jinn to vanquish the Crimson Herald. But the aberration proved more powerful than the Jinn himself, casting him aside like desert dust. Vim. Always Vim. It was all he said as the creature finally reached Isari, her light extinguished in his shadowed grasp. Reader, how to describe this loss? Her soul, torn from the mortal plane, yet denied true peace. With their final chance slipping through their hands and conjoined Ama and Ama frantically running aimlessly, blinded by the creature, Shaq's cunning mind hatched a ruthless idea. Whispering to Tulrock, he urged him to banish the creature as far away as possible. And so, for his third and final wish, Tulrock sent the Crimson Herald to the Red Kingdom's capital, straight to Zamolxis. Ramidava would bear the burden of the Herald's wrath now, whatever horrors that would bring. On the verge of flickering out entirely, Adam's spirit seemed doomed to dissolve like Isari's, but then lights above shimmered and the celestial chariot formed of glittering stars descended towards them. A rescue, perhaps, though none could be certain. Tulrock, loyal as ever, boarded with his master, hoping to shield Adam in his spectral form wherever the chariot might take them. They vanished into the skies, bound for a place whispered in the wind, Winterheim. And so, with Isari's light extinguished and Adam vanished into the heavens, King Evander Pax Green stood blinded and nearly alone in the desert. His magical advisor lost, his celestial guide gone, he was left with only Shaklashak, his brutal green cloak protector, and the clever street twins, Ama and Ama. Sarmisejetuza lay ahead, but their strength was at its end. And in Ramidava, only the gods knew what carnage the Crimson Herald would bring. Above, amid the constellations, a fragment of Isari's spirit, who longed to join the celestial realm, floated towards the star Sirius, where it lingered faintly, welcoming her to take her place in the eternal light. Isari's essence was absorbed into the heart of Sirius, and she became one with the stars. Isari was no more. But as for what fate awaited her companions under Vim's watchful gaze, only time would tell. That's all for now, reader dear. A bleak hour has fallen upon our heroes, and the sands hold more secrets still. But until next time, keep your courage strong, for in the deserts of Vim's will, there is no room for weakness. And, perhaps, reader, no room for mercy either. This was the recap for episode 28 of Vim as told by the Book of Recollections. I was Ruxandra Vorotnak, your Vim recap narrator. If you'd like to join us as Vim The Tale of Immortality premieres, tune in on Sunday at 5 p.m. UTC on youtube.com slash New recaps drop every Friday evening. And remember, every subscribe keeps the magic alive. Thanks for sticking with us. Good day, good night, and don't let the vampires bite.